Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos in our Missing Link News show in which we react to the headlines of the day, but with that crucial element restored, which might allow you to really understand what is going on. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it seems that I have to do these episodes much more frequently in recent days because of um, the, the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? The, uh, the so-called President of the United States really is uh, the gift that keeps on giving in terms of unintentional comedy. In fact, he says ridiculous things so often. He lets slip out of his mouth uh, when he wanders away from what his staffers told him he was supposed to say, um, things which uh, the media has to go to ever more far-fetched lengths to try to explain away, to try to tell the public basically, you didn't see what you just saw. Now, this was parody in the context of 1984. Um, you wake up one morning to find that um, the war against Eurasia has become the war against East Asia with the misinformation disclaimer saying um, anyone who says different is wrong, um, even though the one who said different just yesterday was they themselves. Well, it's interesting that the media is basically doing the same thing. The most recent example of this you may have seen um, in Detroit when the so-called president of the United States uh, went there to um, speak uh, in a rally to um, a group of voters about uh, the time that he met the current mayor of Detroit, who I believe was elected in like 2018, 2019, um, and he told about the curious circumstances in which um, they got to spend a lot of time together in at recent times. He said that um, uh, he was uh, sent there specifically by President Obama as Vice President Biden to help the city of Detroit address the pandemic. Now, it's interesting that the same person who would like us to believe that um, President Trump was singularly responsible for releasing or unleashing the pandemic into the world, um, even though that happened all the way in China, very far away from anything he had explicit control over, the same person who wants us to believe that is the same person who also tells us that um, he met the current mayor of Detroit uh, when Obama was president, specifically because he had been sent there as vice president to deal with the pandemic. Now, as could be predicted, um, the few um, outlets within the media who will even acknowledge that this did happen, if you do a search um, in the news section of Google for um, Biden Detroit, what you'll find is headlines saying, Biden tries to uh, inspire uh, African-American voters to support him this November. Um, and nothing, no mention whatsoever of this within most of the headlines, unless you go to someone like Fox News or something. It's interesting that to the extent that they've tried to respond to this explicitly, those within the Biden camp or the um, state-controlled media, um, their excuse is something along the lines of usually, well, he meant to say he was sent there by President um, Obama to address the uh, bailout of the big car companies, which, of course, did happen when Obama was president all the way back in 2009. See, I'm able to remember that, um, despite being obviously much less intelligent than the guy who's in the White House right now. In fact, this guy is so intelligent that he's um, starting to uh, want to crack down on the spreaders of misinformation and fake news and hate speech who are none other than the um, polling firms, which are basically being paid by him to oversample Democrats to make his poll numbers look better than they are. Well, now that his poll numbers have dropped yet again since the last time I talked about them on the Missing Link News show, from 38% to 36%. He's lost two points just since then. He's actually doubled down on the denialism. He's arguing um, in response to these polls um, really nothing except I don't believe them. Okay, You may have seen this headline in recent days. His response to the polls is just simply I don't believe them. Now that's interesting coming from the same people who told us four years ago that anyone who didn't believe that say um, Biden was 17 points ahead in Wisconsin, a state which he did win. Of course, they had to pause the vote counting and have a bunch of ballots appear in Milwaukee in the middle of the night for that to happen um, in the 2020 erection. I actually have to say that instead of the word that is spelled with an L because um, the um, AI that does the censorship here on YouTube appears to be mistaken about what I'm actually talking about here. You may have noticed on my latest Missing Link episode, there's a little disclaimer there about why um, the uh, voting machines used here in India are safe and effective, um, despite the fact that I actually didn't mention anything about voting machines in this country. I've only ever talked about the upcoming erection in the United States of America, but be that as it may, because the AI robots are actually not so intelligent when it comes to things like censorship, um, especially um, for that reason. From here on, we're only going to be talking about the upcoming 24 erection, ironically, <laughs> between two very old men, one of whom I'm certain can't even get one naturally anyway anymore. So it's interesting that we got to be talking about um, an 80, what, 82-year-old um, geriatric um, 
suffer of impotence with the euphemism erection, but that is the world we're living in today. But anyway, in 2020, um, anyone who denied the poll, I remember just very, very soon before um, November, saying that Biden was 17 points ahead in Wisconsin, a state which was actually far, far closer than that. Um, the same people, they're basically saying you shouldn't even be allowed your First Amendment right to post on Twitter before it was owned by Elon Musk. Um, you should basically be banned from all social media and put onto a watch list if you question whether the beloved upcoming leader is really 17 points ahead in a swing state, which once again was decided by a much, much smaller margin than that. But four years later, it seems that um, polling denialism is the thing that you're supposed to engage in as your moral duty. There's actually no reason given by Biden whatsoever to disbelieve the polls, except um, that he doesn't like what they have to say. Or maybe beyond that, his reason for disbelieving them, uh, despite the fact that, once again, these are being carried out by professionals whose job is to inflate his numbers by oversampling Democrats on the assumption that he really received um, 80 million um, uh, votes in the last erection four years ago. In other words, um, this old fart is more popular than uh, Shraddha Kapoor, one of the uh, most attractive women on the face of the earth. Well, certainly, I'm sure most more people want to follow this old fart um, by a long shot, and that's uh, the justification for making um, his poll numbers, even after that much oversampling, um, seem to be the high number, the artificially inflated number of 36%, as opposed to what 25 is his probably uh, the real one. But at any rate, um, the reason for him to engage in this kind of explicit poll denialism is something which is um, ironically exactly what he attributed um, to Mitt Romney just 12 years ago. Now, most of you probably have forgotten, but I haven't. Um, the night of the erection in 2012, they were interviewing David Axelrod as the votes were being counted um, on like ABC News or something like that. David Axelrod, one of the highest ranking um, advisors to President Obama, and they asked him what he predicted was going to happen, and he basically dismissed Romney as somebody who was relying on almost like a religious supernatural belief that he was going to win despite the fact that he was behind in the polls. And he um, kind of gave like a Richard Dawkins style dismissal of it by saying, look, um, we're confident we're going to win because we're going on data. We looked at the polls and the numbers and scientific stuff like that. Whereas for Romney, it's just an intangible belief that he has that he's going to win. And he really thinks that at some point in the night, that belief is going to materialize into a real thing that's going to push him over the edge to have him win those cru uh, crucial battleground states, like especially Ohio. And it's interesting that the same thing which Axelrod was mocking Romney for, almost like in a religious sense, that Romney being associated with the party, which at that time was supposed to be the party of, you know, uh, backward religious people in the view of someone like David Axelrod, whereas the Democrats were supposed to be the party of secular rationalists of the Richard Dawkins variety. It's interesting that um, that's really been turned around on its head 12 years later. Now it's Biden who disbelieves the data and the numbers and the scientific methods of the polling um, for no reason except that he has an intangible belief that he's going to win, which he thinks is going to materialize sometime in November, maybe five days after the erection, um, and push him over the edge. And in fact, he's so certain about this belief materializing on its own in a supernatural manner, that he um, doesn't actually feel the need to do anything really to actually work for it. He'll hold a few very, very small rallies in, let's say, the state of uh, Michigan or the state of Arizona to show the media that he's um, really taking seriously um, the need to, um, you know, uh, treat these as actual battleground states, whereas in reality, we can rest assured that they're solid blue states which are going to find some way to go for him this November, but it's all something which really can only make sense if he's doing exactly the same thing which he accused Romney of doing 12 years ago. I do think, however, that it would be important or useful to interrogate the philosophical basis of this era in a way that goes beyond the Richard Dawkins style caricature of, on the one hand, people who believe in data and numbers and science. On the other hand, people who have a vague belief in a supernatural force to help them do what they won't do on their own. I think it goes beyond that, and the person who did the best job of addressing this um, was uh, John Michael Greer in a post from almost a year ago. In August of 2023, he had a post on Ecosophia about the stormtrooper fallacy, I believe it was called, um, in which he um, used as um, the explanation to show why the Ukrainian counteroffensive failed so miserably, but it's equally applicable, I think, to what you see on the part of the media and the Democrat Party, and especially the so-called President of the United States. Now, in 
the context of the Ukrainian counteroffensive, Greer noted that the stormtrooper fallacy is um, something which you see in Star Wars, but it really begins with Tolkien. In Star Wars, the stormtroopers are um, a very curious sort of soldier, aren't they? Because um, they, uh, there might be hundreds of them all firing at the same time, and yet not a single bullet or ray from the ray gun will ever actually hit the target. It's interesting that Luke Skywalker can just basically walk through um, the um, uh, rain, uh, raining down of all of these shots from the ray guns of hundreds of stormtroopers without ever getting hurt. And insofar as they might make it look like they're trying to hit something, it's more like they're trying not to hit anything because their purpose or being within the story, the role that they play, is simply to add some theatrical um, fireworks to make um, the inevitable victory of the hero look a little bit better. But there's no question about whether they'll ever actually succeed in hitting him uh, because um, the uh, outcome of the battle is already decided um, on grounds that have nothing to do with, like, the physical science of ballistics. So, you know, the physical science of whether a bullet can hit its target when being fired from a gun is totally irrelevant because that's not what determines the outcome of war great wars and battles within history. What determines that, we know, even if we can't put it into words while watching Star Wars, is a um, morality. We know that Luke Skywalker has to win because he's good. And we know that the stormtroopers and Darth Vader have to lose because they're evil. And this is something which is kind of put into a more simplified form, a more absurdly unrealistic form within a film like Star Wars, but it really goes back um, to Tolkien. And insofar as this was invented by one particular thinker, it was actually Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings, because there too, we have the understanding that, um, what is it, Saruman or Sauron? It's been many years since I've actually read that book. Um, you know, the leader of the evil side. Um, we know that he's um, motivated by nothing except his own evil, and for that reason, uh, because he is evil personified, he has no choice except to lose ultimately in the end, because Frodo and the guys that are on his side are, in contrast, nothing really except good. And um, the orcs are the best example of this, because the orcs are those beings within fiction uh, for whom there really is no motivation whatsoever for anything they do except sheer evil itself. And this idea that there's a causative relation, in other words, between one's level of morality and one's success in history in really deadly serious things like, say, warfare, the <laughs> outcome of battles and wars, is determined by the level of morality of the people engaging in it, it sounds like a ridiculous caricature or a parody of a theory when you phrase it in those terms, but it's something which pretty much everyone in the West actually does believe, especially in the context of pitting, say, the United States against Russia. Well, Putin has to lose because he's evil, and they kind of build him up into the same sort of evil dictator of a dark empire that Sauron or Darth Vader, etc., would be, never mind the fact that Darth Vader isn't technically the Emperor, Emperor Palpatine uh, would be within the Star Wars, and that's what the sort of caricature they've built Putin up into, which um, has been so successful at uh, convincing them that he can't lose, that they didn't bother to investigate more mundane things, like, say, whether their military technologies they were sending to Ukraine at tunes of over $100 billion worth of taxpayer money um, were any match for what Russia had, or on a more fundamental level, whether they actually functioned. And and the reason why we have a very strange situation in the present day in which um, Ukraine is demanding 500,000 soldiers after claiming they've only lost 30,000. Now think about that for a second. You know, there's a level of arithmetic. You know, the people who believe in data and numbers and science, um, well, they're not the people, certainly, who could... Um, take seriously the claim that Ukraine would need 500,000 additional soldiers after losing only 30,000, because those two numbers simply do not match one another. There seems to be a bit of, oh, what's the word, misinformation there with regard to how many um, soldiers Ukraine has actually lost over the past two plus years. But be that as it may, the idea, really from not just Tolkien, but from like the legends of King Arthur, that um, a uh, knight in battle can have a sword which is supernaturally endowed with the kind of power to actually slice through the swords of people who are not just inferior as soldiers, um, but are inferior morally, that uh, the good guy has a sword which um, he doesn't really have to worry about taking seriously the idea that he could lose because it can simply slice through the enemy's swords, is something with the basis of truth back in the Dark Ages, because as Greer noted in that post, in the Dark Ages it really was the case that due to technological regression and things like that, um, some 
swords that had been forged in earlier times when the Roman Empire was more stable and technology um, was more advanced than it became in the Dark Ages, someone with a sword like that with better materials probably could, you know, in the right hands, slice through a very inferior sword in terms of technology, in terms of raw materials, etc., that had been, been forged under some other circumstances. So there was an element of truth in the Dark Ages that something like that could happen. The problem is that the technological and resource element has been subtracted out of it, and it's been turned into a situation in which we understand the morality of the soldier to have a causative relation to his sword slicing through the others. And this was something which, once again, sounds like a parody of a theory when we phrase it in those terms, but it's literally what um, the West thought was going to happen in the counteroffensive. They figured that um, the weapons given to Ukraine by the West should slice clean through the entire Russian military infrastructure simply because it was coming from people who were morally better. On what grounds? Well, just that they believe in 68 genders. Remember all of those years we heard this uh, propaganda about um, Putin not being open to more than two genders or all of these other sort of caricatures, well, that's really what they were trying to set up was the idea that um, he can't win because he's morally inferior or he's just plain evil, whereas we're not. And it's interesting that that's exactly the basis of the pole denialism you see today. The belief that someone who believes in 68 genders can't lose the erection this fall because there's a causative relation between his moral purity and his ability to defeat huge deficits in polling in battleground states. Now, there might be something else which can lead him to overcome that, but it certainly will not be his moral purity. But even if he manages to get some of the next four years before he drops dead, the thing that he won't be able to slice clean through are all of the economic and foreign policy problems which he himself has created largely through not realizing he was president most of his presidency. Now, the last thing we should say about the Stormtrooper fallacy is that the only justification which could be given to have it make sense as a theory, even for someone as obviously intelligent as Tolkien himself, um, was exactly what has been stripped out of it in its more recent form. So the only way you could possibly argue that history is determined by a causative relation between the moral goodness of the winners and the evil, the moral badness of the losers, is, of course, you have to have some sort of religious explanation, which, of course, Tolkien himself had. He was not only a Christian, but like a Roman Catholic, I believe, and a political conservative. And especially within Catholicism, the morality of individuals matters in a way that it really wouldn't within Protestantism. In Calvinism, for example, we have an understanding that even if somebody seems to be morally good, they're still in the eyes of God, uh, such a filthy and um, irredeemable sinner that um, they can't ever hope to do enough good works to earn their salvation because human nature itself is so depraved that you can only be predestined by God through an act of grace to salvation, and everybody who doesn't, of course, is predestined for damnation. Well, that's not the kind of Christianity, I believe, which uh, Tolkien practiced as a Roman Catholic. There was an emphasis on trying to put in the effort to be as morally pure an individual or person as you could be. If you reach the top of that ladder, you actually uh, get the title of saint, right? So that's the worldview which Tolkien was working in, in which um, history could be determined um, by moral purity, not only because there was a God who could intervene, but specifically a God who also wanted each human individual to put in a lot of work to try to be as good as they could be. The problem is that that has been totally subtracted from the present context in which it is believed unthinkingly, without any need for evidence, by the vast majority of people in the West. They, they get it largely through the narratives, especially the film version narratives of, say, The Lord of the Rings or Star Wars and countless other films that basically share the same ideology without believing anything that the author had in mind with regard to religion, etc. So it's interesting that um, even though Biden claims to be more religious than Trump in the sense that he technically goes to church more often, even if he only shows up for the photo op before having the Secret Service men sneak him out of the church a few seconds after the news cameras have left um, to go do what he'd really rather do that morning, which is, you know, nap or, um, you know, uh, whatever crazy uh, stuff he engages on in his free time, which I don't want to think about. But um, be that as it may, even though uh, Biden and still maintains this facade of, you know, being more religious, actually, than Trump. Um, we all know that the people running um, his party are people who are more like the Richard Dawkins variety, basically the idea that we are more moral than the other party, precisely because we don't believe in superstitions of that kind, precisely because we only believe that technology and progress and 
SJWism and 68 genders, those are the sort of things that make us morally pure precisely because we don't believe in a quote-unquote outdated religion from the Middle Ages. And it's interesting that um, they are trying to uphold the stormtrooper fallacy, which once again, as a theory, will seem ridiculous unless you have that religious context of a conservative Roman Catholic restored. They're trying to maintain it without the religious context. And this is exactly the sort of irrationality which um, Curtis Yarvin also exposed Richard Dawkins for engaging in in his book, How Dawkins Got Pwned, which I did a video on just this month as part of the AMA series. Richard Dawkins know that, um, or excuse me, Curtis Yarvin know that Richard Dawkins believes in progress really as a secularized version of the Calvinist notion of providence. And while it can be debated whether or not it's rational to believe in providence in its Calvinist context, it's certainly not rational to believe in it outside that context. And even more so, it's certainly not rational to believe in the stormtrooper fallacy um, outside of anything like the context which Tolkien intended it for. And that is exactly what is leading to so many problems, which could have been prevented, but at this point, um, they're just counting on the sword that slices through all blades to bail them out of their own mistakes.